Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar for June of 2024. Um, I'm going to say a few words introducing the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment before introducing our speaker for today. The Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment is an organized research unit here at UT comprised of uh, 26 uh, different faculty members who do research in a broad range of subsurface energy topics. Um, these include things like conventional oil and gas, but we also do a lot of work on other types of energy, for example, um, geothermal, gas hydrates, uh, we do work on energy storage, carbon capture, hydrogen, um, and we come from a variety of different technical backgrounds, which really speaks to the breadth uh, and interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary nature of what, we, of what we do. We use a large variety of engineering tools for our work, including simulations, experiments, um, and you know, different types of models and you know, software and that sort of thing. Much of our research happens through our very successful industrial affiliate programs, which you can see listed here. Uh, these cover a broad range of disciplines within the center. Um, you can find more information on these at our website. And uh, if you're interested in any of these topic areas, you can reach out to the directors of these IAPs uh, for more information. A little bit about our monthly webinar series. Um, these are intended to be informative and really industry-driven webinars that help get the work, great work that we do here within the center out there to all of you who are interested in implementing and learning and keeping up to date on what's going on here. We host these on the second Tuesday of each month at noon central time on Teams. Um, we then will record the webinars and they're uploaded to our YouTube channel uh, within a few days. So if you miss it or you want to go back and listen to it again, it's up there. Um, here's just a list of some of our upcoming webinars. Our July and August slots, uh, we're still looking to fill those, but um, September we'll have Dr. Rakuno, uh, October we'll have Dr. Sharma, and then November um, Dr. Hidari uh, will be talking. And here are just some screen captures of some of the previous uh, webinars that we've had. Uh, we have sponsorship opportunities for our webinars. You can sponsor these at a level of 5,000 per webinar. We uh, put your name and your logo prominently uh, in the webinar flyer and at the beginning and end. Um, it gives you access to our live audience, which is industry, government, academia, um, that's publicized to a broad audience, and then it's then posted on YouTube after the live event. And our YouTube channel is pretty good. We've got over 14,000 views in the last two years. Many of our webinars have accumulated over 1,000 views individually. Um, and so for you as a sponsor, you get you know to reach a global targeted audience and associate your brand with what we like to think is high quality research and education that we do here. And then you help support the mission of CSEE to continue advancing our research and education. Um, if you're interested in this, feel free to contact me for more information. Okay, without further ado, now I'm gonna to introduce today's webinar speaker, who is Dr. Michael Perch. Um, Dr. Perch, like me, is a former Chevron employee. He uh, joined the faculty here uh, several years ago now and is, runs a very successful uh, program on uh, machine learning and uh, data analytics. Um, he uh, is also comes on the, on the geosciences side. He's got a joint appointment uh, with the Jackson School and uh, he's very active on social media. You probably see him posting on Twitter and LinkedIn with information about all his education stuff that he puts on. He, along with Dr. Foster, um, host our very successful hackathon every year. So I uh, can't say you know enough great stuff about what Dr. Perch has done. But uh, today he's gonna be talking to us about how to apply machine learning as a competent engineer or geoscientist, which I know we all are. So uh, this should be very, very relevant uh, to everybody out there. So um, anyway, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Dr. Perch. Oh yeah, before I do, please post your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can either during the presentation or at the end and, um, uh, um, and, and get to those questions. And again, we'll upload this to the YouTube channel. Okay, so now over to Dr. Perch.
Professor Daigle, thank you very much for that warm introduction. I do appreciate to all of the attendees online. I know it's summertime. Thank you very much for joining in for this discussion. Now, this is something that's been kind of heavy on my mind. I've been thinking a lot about what it is to be a competent engineer or geoscientist. As Dr. Daigle mentioned, I'm appointed both in the Jackson School of Geosciences and the Cockrell School of engineering. And the goal, if you ask any one of us professors, is to produce competent engineers or competent geoscientists. In fact, if you talk to our students, they all say they want to learn to be competent professionals. And so I've been thinking about what that means in the fourth paradigm where we have so many new machine learning and data analytics methodologies. Now, everybody knows that professors stand on the shoulders of great students. And to make points today, I will show examples from current and former graduate students. And I've listed some of them right here. I do appreciate all of their hard work. I do cite the students when I show their work. I'm also very happy to be able to discuss student internships and full-time hires. Let me know if you're looking for great engineers and geoscientists with data science skills. Also, I want to acknowledge I do a lot of collaboration with other professors within the center and the department, and these professors are listed here. Dr. Foster and myself, we co-lead the direct consortium. Let us know if you want to work together, collaborate on subsurface data analytics and machine learning, and shout out to member companies. I know right now that we have individuals joining us from Core to Energy. I heard from them, Chevron, shout out to people who are joining from our member companies. Also, S&P Global does support my research and we appreciate all of their support. Also, a shout out to the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. Professor Hugh Daigle is doing a wonderful job leading the center. Emilio, thank you very much for all you do to promote and to build and to get us going. Joanna and Michelle, thank you very much for all you do to support us. I want to full disclosure now, admit, that my industrial consortium administrative staff support are all organized through the center and I do appreciate that essential administrative support to everything I do. What's my motivation? You can't turn on the TV without hearing about data science. Chat GBT 4.0, whatever it is, we're hearing about these large language, language models, we're hearing about disruptions in the workplace. There is a tidal wave of new applications with machine learning, deep learning, data science, and so forth. Now, that tidal wave has actually been reaching into the subsurface. For us that work in energy and resources in the subsurface, we are seeing a wave of new applications and opportunities with data analytics and machine learning. But what's very interesting is that this is nothing new to us. We have vast experience with data-driven workflows. I'm going to make the point and demonstrate it that we have about 70 years of experience working with data-driven approaches. So we have great experience. Now, what we need to do is we need to integrate the concept of competent engineering and geoscience. We admit it. That is our goal here is to be competent with our experience in data-driven workflows with the emerging data analytics and machine learning workflows to ensure that we're doing it right. And that's the goal here. So let's step back. I spent a little bit of time and I kind of reflected. And I remember those days when I was a young student engineer in training. I am a professional engineer in the province of Alberta. And I remember going through my training program and getting certified as a professional engineer, having to basically read and memorize vast amounts of content and contracts and law and what it is to be a competent engineer. I reflected on some of those original textbooks. And what I realized is that it's important. It's something very valuable for us to be a competent engineer and geoscientist. And that's something very special. And it's something that has got to be at the heart of everything we do. And I also realized that there's a lot of lessons learned from our extensive subsurface experience. We've been thinking intuitively about how to intrinsically, it's cooked into everything we do, how to do it in a way that we're competent professionals. And so how does this guide our use of machine learning in the subsurface? Okay, so let's go ahead, let's dive into some details. First, we'll talk about what it is to be a competent engineer or geoscientist, and then we're gonna talk about what we know from our experience, and then I'll make recommendations. Okay, first of all, I am a Canadian professional engineer. That means if you look really carefully, I have that iron ring on my finger. Now, my iron ring doesn't look like this iron ring because I have many years of experience as worn smooth, which actually is a sign of experience for us Canadian engineers. 
Now, if anybody there out in the audience knows about the tradition, the ritual of the calling of the engineer at which we received this iron ring, legend has it it was based on a collapse of a bridge in Quebec, the Quebec Bridge. Now, it is a very tragic story because not only did it fail once during construction, it failed twice over the period of about, about a decade, and it resulted in many, many fatalities. I believe somewhere around 70 or 80 construction workers lost their lives and many were injured. And what was found to be at fault was various different root causes related to the transportation of the members, to the way it was being assembled, things went wrong. And at about that point, some years later, a group gathered together and said, we need to establish some type of way to regulate and to ensure adequate training for competent engineering. And so now we can think about that. They, they thought a lot about what it is to be a competent engineer. And so we can reflect on it. I can go back to my old textbooks and I can read again, but I thought a really good idea would be, I went to one of the Canadian provincial associations, one of the professional engineering associations, and I looked up their competency exam outline. And I found 22 key competencies and indicators, and the citation is down here at the bottom. Now, what you'll note is I picked about six of these competencies, and I'm going to use them because I think they're very illustrative and they map very nicely to the concept of data-driven workflows. Number one, risk management for technical work. You got to identify the risks, understand the impact of risks, do risk mitigation, stress testing. You have to be thinking about black swans. What are those unusual events that could come and cause unusual consequences and failure analysis? Once something goes wrong, you have to be able to go back and figure out what went wrong. That's risk management for technical work. Application of theory. I know engineers and geoscientists, as soon as I say that, you're nodding your head. You know the fundamental math, the fundamental statistics, the fundamental physics. We all learned that. We learned how to do differential calculus and so forth so that we could figure out from fundamental principles how to model our systems. We need to have the ability to apply theory application theory, solutions, techniques, and results verification. This one is uniquely well situated for machine learning. It says we need to understand the engineering principles in computer aided solutions. What does that mean? We don't get to ever say we just ran the program. No, we as engineers and geoscientists must understand what's going on under the hood. We never just run the program. Three more, if you will bear with me quality assurance, conduct checks. I remember when I was a young student engineer, I worked with, with a mining engineer on a specific project in South America. It was a really interesting nickel copper deposit. And I was working with the data and the engineer came up to me and said, Michael, be very careful. Every time you touch the data, every time you touch the model, every time you perform an operation, that's a chance to introduce a blunder, an error into your model. What does that mean? Every time we do anything, we need to check. We need diagnostics and we need to be like accountants. We need to close the loop, make sure that everything tallies up. It sums up at the end. We need to close our loops. Engineering documentation, we need to communicate and transfer technology, our designs, our findings, our lessons learned from data and models, documents, and great effective visualizations. When I was an engineer working in Chevron, Hugh, thank you very much for shouting that out, uh, fellow Chevronite. When I was working in Chevron, a senior engineer looked at me and said, Michael, if your work is not understood, it will not be used, it will not add value. Systems and their components, I remember reading a great book that discussed, you could study a B your entire life, one B your entire life, and you would never understand how a beehive works. In other words, you take each of the individual elements of a system and you put them together and there are feedbacks, there are emergent behaviors, they interact. We need to have systems engineering. We need to recognize how things work together. That's systems thinking. Okay, so those are six very valuable topics, key competencies and indicators that we can use to discuss competent engineering and geoscience. And we will use this to guide ourselves in the topic of how we do machine learning. Now, let me pause here. 
I got to give you the fine print. I'm reflecting on engineering competencies recognized in regulatory associations and bodies. I'm thinking about the established subsurface engineering and geoscience experience, some of it coming from my book and my papers and from other papers and books that I've written, and also my personal experience in modeling all over the world. I'm using these to suggest best practices for machine learning in engineering and geoscience, but these are all my opinions as an educator, as an educator or as a practitioner. I do not speak for any professional society association nor regulatory body, so I just want to establish that, that these are my opinions. Let's talk about data analytics and machine learning prerequisites. I can go no further unless I'm to first explain and put us all on the same page as far as data science and machine learning. Much of machine learning is based on data, and much of that data is big data. How do you know if you have big data? If I ask you if you have big data, I would expect almost everybody from the subsurface to put their hand up. Why? The criteria for big data, whether or not you get to claim you have big data, is based on the Vs. Volume, velocity, variety, variability, and veracity. Now, let me just talk about two of them, just so we get a little context. Volume. Many data samples difficult to handle and visualize. Did you know when we're shooting or acquiring new seismic in the Gulf of Mexico, that our transmission rates and our storage requirements rival NASA, JPL, Google, and other fields in which we know they work with a lot of data. We definitely have volume. And many of us know, I think there's people out there nodding their heads going, yeah, I work with data that's very difficult to visualize and work with. Let's talk about veracity. Show of hands, anybody who works with data and has no uncertainty. Anybody? Anybody have their hand up for that? I don't think so. In fact, what I would say, I would challenge all of you. Do we have a single source of information that has certainty? I don't think we do. Our data all has various levels of accuracy, and we have to account for that. Okay, so we have big data. Everybody, we can make that patch, put that patch on our shirts. We have big data. Subsurface has been big data long before tech even learned what big data was. Now let's go ahead and put that within the framework of how we work. We take that big data and we look about and reflect on statistics. Statistics is collecting, organizing, interpreting data as well as drawing conclusions and making decisions. I tell my students, if your work does not impact the decision, you add no value. Okay, now go ahead and Google search what is data analytics. It is analysis of data to support decision making. You may find websites that say business data analytics, visualization, all of this stuff, but really at the end of the day, data analytics is statistics. I said that while on a panel in front of hundreds of working professionals and everyone clapped. I think we all agree there's some rebranding. What does that mean? Let's go back to competency and recognize that we have a wealth of theory fundamental concepts and statistics on which we build our data analytics. It does not give us license to move away from good practice. Machine learning, well, I'll get off my soapbox. Machine learning, you can Google search this like many people do. I found the Wikipedia article and I put a quote here. I underline the principal concepts. It's a study of algorithms, mathematical models. You hear that's plural, it's a toolkit. It's a bunch of different algorithms we work with. They progressively improve their performance on a specific task. So they're learning on sample data known as training data. Okay, a toolkit of algorithms that learn from sample data in order to make predictions or decisions without it being explicitly programmed to perform the task. They're general. You can use the same model to make a prediction over here retrain the model, make a different prediction. They can be used in a whole variety of different cases. They're adaptable. Now, if you read to the end of the article, you're gonna find this statement right here, where it is infeasible to develop an algorithm of specific instructions for performing the task. Hmm, what does that mean? Going back to competency, that means we can't use machine learning instead of understanding the fundamental engineering and geoscience physics. If we have a method by which we can calculate it using engineering and geoscience, we should be using those methods. Okay, so let's go ahead. I'm gonna simultaneously convince you that machine learning is simple and complicated all at the same time. 
From now on, for the rest of your life, anytime anyone says predictive machine learning, and I don't care if it's deep learning, I want you to have this equation in your head. You have a set of inputs. Those are predictor features. The old school statisticians would call this the independent variables. Shout out to the old school statisticians. I'm one of you. We have a function that takes those inputs and maps them to a response feature or features, may, more, may be more than one. It's the dependent variables for my old school statisticians, the outputs of the model. And we acknowledge that our model will have some form of error and we make assumptions about the error often things such as random, independent, homoscedastic, and so forth. This is machine learning. So for the rest of your life, anytime anyone says that, this equation should be in your mind, no matter how complicated but it is embedded into a more complicated workflow. That's the complexity. We have domain expertise. That's our competent engineering and geoscience knowledge being brought in. We have our predictor features and we move through various steps of inferential machine learning where we find structures and we we go ahead and find groupings, stationary groups and so forth. We do feature engineering where we bring in more physics knowledge. We get more informative, informative features to work with and we build our machine learning models with domain expertise, response features. And then we go ahead and we have explainable ML. We do analysis of our models and we use the results to support a decision, so we add value. This is the fundamental idea of machine learning. Let me show you how it gets done. I'm gonna be kind of quick on this, just an overview, because it's important to understand, as we said before, we gotta look under the hood and understand what's going on. How do we build a machine? The fundamental approach is empirical. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take our data and we're going to remove part of the data and call that withheld data, testing data, testing data and the data that we keep is gonna be called training data. We take the training data and we fit a very simple model. A linear regression model would be very simple. Then we go ahead and we increase the complexity of the model, maybe a third order polynomial, a fifth order polynomial, a seventh order polynomial, and so forth. Then we take the withheld testing data and we bring it back and we go ahead and we see how we did. We score it and we pick the model that got the best fit with the withheld testing data. We were training the model parameters with the training data. Now we're tuning the hyperparameter, the degree of complexity with the withheld data. And at the end, we get the very best model to make predictions. Why do we do this? Because if we pick the model that does the best with the training data, not the testing data, we would always pick the most complicated model and we would have an overfit model. The fundamental approach is a cross validation plus simulation of the performance of the model or many models and picking the one that makes the best predictions. Now, I said a couple of terms. I owe you some definitions. Let's go ahead and do it. Model parameters. These are going to be fit to in order to get the very best fit with the training data to minimize the error. So if you're changing the fit of your model with regard to the training data, you know that that's a model parameter. Hyperparameters are totally different. They control the complexity of the model. So if it's changing the flexibility, complexity of the model, that's called a hyperparameter. First order, second order, third order, polynomial, that is the hyperparameter here. Okay, so this was very important because we needed to look under the hood and understand exactly what machine learning is doing. And this is gonna help guide us so that we're able to move forward. Okay, you know, I, I already got a question. And I think it's a good idea to publish it. Okay, let's see, where'd the question go? Oh, publish, there it is. Okay, I'm figuring this out. Okay, um, Mo said, just want to add, the only place you create certainty is in your assumption. So any other certainty is only a derivation of, of our assumptions. And I think that's really important. Often when people ignore uncertainty, remember, it is assuming certainty. And many times when we build a model, we have to make assumptions. In fact, Andre Jornel told us, when you're considering uncertainty, do not get on the circular quest for objectivity, which means you start saying, oh, here's an uncertainty model. Oh, but there's uncertainty in the uncertainty model. So now you start modeling the uncertainty in the uncertainty in the uncertainty. At some point you just 
cut it off. You've got a reasonable amount of uncertainty accounted for, and you have to assume a certainty for certainty for what remains. So I do, Mo, thank you very much for that comment. Also, I do appreciate every time we say uncertainty, say model, because there is no objective uncertainty. It really is a model that just tries to understand our ignorance, our lack of knowledge about the phenomenon we're mobbing. Thank you, Mo, thank you very much for that early question. I do appreciate it. I'll keep looking up for questions. Model overfit. Let's go ahead and talk about that. When we go from a simple to a complicated model, we're tuning the hyperparameter. The error in training will keep falling. At some point, your model's complicated enough to perfectly fit your training data. But there is a point where the training, the testing error will start to increase. This region is called the overfit area. Now, this is really important because at that point, you're starting to fit data noise, data idiosyncrasies. And so we have to make sure we're not overfitting our models. Now, in order to fully understand machine learning, please allow me to show one interactivity. And right now I'm going to just announce Every time I show an interactivity, every time I go through a demonstration, there's going to be a link to a workflow. And that workflow is available on my GitHub account with the data. So everything I'm showing you today is repeatable, reproducible by you. Okay, so I have a model on data. The data is very simple. Spoiler alert, the data is on a quadratic. It's a parabola. And I have test and train error, test and train data, pink is train, blue is test, and I'm going to show you the plot of complexity versus error. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. We'll start with the world's most simple model, my linear model. That's a first order polynomial. This is the error distribution for the test is blue, the train is purple. That's an error. You see that zero negative and positive error. Truth minus model. Now we go ahead and I'm going to increase the complexity. What do you think is going to happen when I increase the complexity? Am I going to do better? Let's go to second order polynomial. Watch it really carefully. First order, second order. Everybody see what happened? Error goes to zero. We're perfectly fitting the data. The world is a happy place. We have a very good model. What will happen if I continue to increase my model complexity? You can try this out at home. You could download and open up this Jupyter Notebook. If you go ahead and go to third order polynomial, any predictions? Is it going to get worse? Watch carefully. Do you see the difference? I'll go back to second order polynomial one more time. See the difference? What happened? Oh, maybe we were lucky. Maybe we were just lucky. Let's go ahead and increase the complexity. We should start to see overfit. Ready for it? Fourth order. Do you see overfit? Nothing happened. Isn't that interesting? Nothing happened at all. I'll tell you what, I'll jump all the way to 12th order polynomial. No problem, everything's fine. Now, if you look really carefully, I have a noise dial right here. I can add random stochastic noise to all of the training and testing data. 1% noise. Everybody get ready. Like imagine 1% noise is very, very little noise. 12th order polynomial model complicated model, 1% noise in three, two, one. Look what happened. Boom. I think boom is the right way to describe this. It really blew up. In other words, you're seeing a lot of overfit. We're fitting perfectly the training data, the testing data. We're doing horrible. Okay. What did we learn here? We learned how sensitive our machine learning models are to high complexity plus noise in the data. Now, let me ask you a question. Does our data have noise? Every single time there's noise. And I, even if you have great measurement accuracy, there's all kinds of imprecision with regard to spatial location, accounting for scale, exactly where did the production come from? There's all kinds of error sources. What do we learn? Data analytics is statistics. Spatial data analytics is geostatistics. Machine learning is statistical learning. It's all based on a fundamental theory of statistics and engineering and geoscience. Machine learning overfit is due to noisy data plus too complicated a model, and we demonstrated it. We showed it to you. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's review established subsurface competent practice. Now, this is what we've developed over about 70 years of subsurface modeling, all the way from Danny Krieg and later. Now, how do we know we have that history? Let's go back in time. Let's get in the time machine and go back to 1930s and 1940s. Kormogorov, his 
probability axioms. Do you ever wish you could go on a time machine? I wish I could go on a time machine. I would go back in time and I would go ahead and come up with, I could have come up with this. They'd be called Perch's probability axioms. All probabilities must be non-negative. They can be zero or any number above that. Uh, the probabilities should be below one and probabilities should sum to one if you consider all possible things that can occur. That's Comer Goroff's fundamental axioms. Danny Craig came along and found statistical methodologies and good good practical approaches for making spatial estimates and gold mines in South Africa. Matheron came along afterwards and developed all the theory and a bunch of Verily, Deutsch and Journal and others developed all the applications and open source for oil and gas environmental. People are using it for trees and forestry and for agriculture and everything. Okay, we are the original data driven science and engineering fields. We have been big data long before tech learned what big data was, and we were driven there because the heterogeneous, sparsely sampled, vast systems with complicated physics and high value decisions. That's what happened. Okay, what have we learned because of that? Number one, our data is always biased. In fact, if you went into your boss's office and you said, I want to sample my data, randomly so it's representative or regular so it's representative, you probably should update your CV because the way we collect data is to answer questions to reduce uncertainties and also to maximize net present value directly because our data is dual purpose. We sample, but then we use those locations to produce. So we wanna make sure we pick good locations for high production. We must assume our data is biased until proven otherwise. That's risk management right there. What about another concept of risk management, subsurface data? There's uncertainty in everything we do. All salient sources of uncertainty must be characterized and integrated. Uncertainty is represented by multiple models and optimum decisions must be made jointly over all of the individual models, realizations and scenarios. Now, Clayton Deutsch, my PhD advisor, went on a distinguished lecture tour and one of his talks was use all the realizations and scenarios all the time. I thought that was a great idea. He was advocating for let the computer do the work and have a large enough suite of models. Don't, don't truncate it. Don't go to very few models quickly in order to calculate the optimum decision. Good uncertainty models, more important than one best estimate. That's what we learned. Spatial context. We have correlation in space and time. Have you ever used a statistical method and it says IID, independent, identically distributed? Mm, our data is not. It's not independent. It's correlated in space. It's not identically distributed. It changes locally. You see that how these are high values. These are low values. That happens all over the place. We must calculate and model and integrate spatial continuity in everything we do. That's a spatial context. Scale and volume support is the second component of spatial context that we must integrate. Every statistic assumes a scale. In fact, you cannot produce a histogram without stating and assuming a scale 100 meter by 100 meter blocks right here, 200 meters right here, 500 meters right here, and you see the distributions are significantly changing. We must integrate scale we must account for scale. We must correct for scale differences between data and model at all steps of our workflows. Model checking. You remember that concept that every time you touch the data, every time you do an operation, that's a chance to introduce a blunder. And so what did we learn? We learned that we need to check everything we do. Our models are applied to support important high value decisions. And we have to make sure that when we put something in the model, we get it back. Something didn't go wrong. We check every step, we close every loop. That's quality assurance. That's competent engineering and geoscience. Subsurface um, data-driven systems and their components. We have many, many information sources that all must be integrated together. Now, Every time we do that, we greatly add the value to our models, but we have to build on a foundation of physics and statistics. We have to do it right. We have Bayesian updating, soft data encoding for uncertain data. We have Monte Carlo simulation. We can bootstrap to build an uncertain model. We can do spatial bootstrap. We cannot afford to omit any valuable information, and we have to understand how it all fits together. Prior, likelihood, posture, 
this is this is a model that I constructed just recently with some synthetic data. We have to be able to ensure we understand the system. And when it comes to engineering documentation, you can't beat reserves. Now, we all know those of us who work in the subsurface that reserves is a very special category that requires a lot of attention to the competent engineer and geoscientist involved in that process. We need well-developed definitions for proven, probable, and possible reserves based on level of certainty. We need certainty established through geologic and engineering data from reliable technologies, and that is well demonstrated and understood. Must include economically feasible extraction plans. We, it's not good enough to say it's down there. We gotta say, how will we get it out within our business plan? And we need independent evaluation and reporting on what we do. It needs to be checked. And most importantly, everything we do must be understandable by the public, i.e. the investors. Okay, so if you want examples of how reserves are being documented, just go to the website, US Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, and look at things like right here, here's an excerpt excerpt where we have q a with specific questions around how do we combine reserves from different subsets of the reservoir and so forth fascinating to go through and see what those standards are we have great experience in that our subsurface modeling best practice gained over decades of practice we have a template for data-driven competent engineering and geoscience we have standards already established for us Okay, so what I'm going to do with my remaining time, about 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about some proposed standards for machine learning, engineering, and geoscience, competent practice. Now, I when I was doing this, I recognized about 10 different topics I could have talked about, like right off the top of my head, and I kind of high graded. I think I picked like three or four of them. So if you want to talk about more topics, I'm happy to discuss. We know that our sparsely sampled data is biased, not sampled for representativity. Okay, so now will your machine learning model debias itself? Let's first talk about geostatistics because that's where our experience is very strong. In a geostatistical workflow, we take all of our inputs, we put them through geostatistical simulation, and we get realizations. Our uncertainty model, many models, we apply a transfer function like flow simulation, and we get decision criteria. Model checking is looking at the realizations and making sure that the data, the distributions, the variogram, the training images, the correlations, the trends, making sure it's all reproduced in these models. Now, what's very interesting is what that says is that geostatistics recognizes that this input is honored in the output. In other words, geostatistics does not debias the data. We must debias the data first. We must take responsibility. Now, let me ask you this, is our data biased? I went all over North America, looked at shale gas. I looked at the initial productions, uh, three month uh, cumulative production. And what I found when I applied standard debiasing methodologies, 4%, 5%, 8%, I have examples of 15%, getting closer to 20% um, biased high. In other words, when we applied these best practices, we reduced the average production over three months by about 10%, 8% or lower. Okay, so our data is biased, consistently biased in so many ways. And it's because we reduce uncertainty, maximize value, right? So I'm not complaining. I'm just saying it is biased. Okay, so now what happens when biased data hits machine learning? Wendy Liu, I should say doctor, one of my early PhD students, we sat in my office right there and we asked the question, what will happen with machine learning? Does it debias? So what Wendy did was she built a whole bunch of synthetic data sets and she had no bias, regular sampling, a little bit biased and super biased. She had a dial. She could produce many data sets and change the degree of bias. She ran them through a decision tree model because it's a very simple model that we can understand. And she applied without debiasing and with debiasing to see if it made a difference. Now, for a decision tree, it's very simple to put debiasing in. In fact, the prediction for decision tree is just the average within each one of the regions or what they call leaf nodes in the tree. And so all we had to do is weight those averages and our loss function, the residual sum of squares error, could actually be weighted. And so we included the weights just doing that. 
Now, when we did that, what we found was there was a massive change in the behavior. The predictions, when we used the regular decision tree, we trained with biased data and we tested with unbiased data. We found the bias print remains in all of the predictions from the training. But when we debiased the tree, we greatly reduced that amount of bias. Okay, so what did we find? Machine learning methodologies do not inherently de-bias or account for the bias in our data. And so we as competent engineers and geoscientists, we must take ownership of our inputs for machine learning and we must first get representative distributions. And that is not an easy thing to do. Relevant engineering and geoscience competencies, most of them, most of the actually, all of, almost all of them, risk management for technical work, application of theory, sampling theory, solution techniques and results verification. You can't just run the model. Quality assurance, you got to check. Systems, how do things interact with each other when you have bias with the data? Let's talk about model checking. This is kind of a, this is a very fundamental concept. We have already developed model checking criteria for geostatistical methods. Are these sufficient for machine learning? So let's go back, Or Luantong and McLennan and Deutsch, my former PhD advisor, they came up with a great idea, minimum acceptance criteria that was pu published back in 2004. In other words, it's very intuitive. Everything you put in the model, check it. And so they check the data reproduction or exactitude, they check the histogram and the verigram, they check the uncertainty model by cross-validation, they check everything. And, and then Jeff Boisvert, Professor up there in Alberta, and I was part of that. We went ahead and extended it for MPS, which is more image-based simulations. What we found is that worked very well, but is that sufficient for machine learning? Now, when it comes to generative machine learning, you're actually creating complicated images. And what we found was that those standard statistical tests were not able to capture the differences between these images. Couldn't really see how things were varying. And so what we had to do was we had to develop new methods to check high dimensional non-stationary spatial uncertainty models. And so one of my students, Lei Liu, who's co-advised by Dr. Perdonovich, uh, shout out to Dr. Perdonovich in Croatia right now, study abroad. Um, we developed new metrics to check non-stationarity. Here we're checking the non-stationary regions of the models. We're checking the local uncertainty models with local measures of categorical entropy. And what we found, in fact, was there were some interesting effects. Edge effects with low, low entropy or uncertainty. The model is frozen at the edges. That's important to know. We found that at times the non-stationarity was not always preserved. And then what we did is we took the models, many realizations with the training images and projected them in a low dimensional space using, using inferential machine learning methods like TSNE and MDS. And when we did that, what we found was that we could see how these models were different from each other and similar to their training images. What did we find? Our models are used to support expensive subsurface development decisions, and we must develop new methods and standards for model checking because our generative machine learning models are more complicated. They reproduce more structure and they may have more unintended consequences. And this all relates to many of our competencies, including the application of theory, solutions, we can't just run the model, quality assurance. Okay, uncertainty modeling, this is the last one. I'll just talk about this briefly. In general, there are many, there is a significant amount of uncertainty associated with our subsurface models. A good uncertainty model is more important than one best estimate. What are the standards for uncertainty modeling with machine learning? Does machine learning intrinsically give us an uncertainty model? Here's what we learned from geostatistics. We needed to build multiple scenarios where we change the choices, things like is it a deltaic or fluvial reservoir? We have to change the model parameters. Is it high net to gross or low net to gross, low porosity, high perm, whatever it might be? And then we use our statistical well-established tools, frequencies and Bayesian probability frameworks, bootstrap, Monte Carlo simulation workflows, Kriging estimates, Kriging variants, realizations to sample the uncertainty space, and transfer functions to get us to the value criteria. Now, you might step back and say, but does geostatistics give a good uncertainty model? My friends, it does. 
In fact, sequential Gaussian simulation is a very complicated thing. If you think about it, what you're trying to do is sample simultaneously from all of these locations, 10 million locations maybe. I've heard about billion cell models simultaneously. And you have to sample from that massive joint probability distribution, but the sequential approach uses a recursive application of Bayes' theorem. And Bayes' theorem does not make any distribution assumptions. And so what's fascinating is that you can pose this whole problem, sequential Gaussian simulation based on Bayes' theorem, and the geostatistical uncertainty model is statistically correct under its assumptions. Okay, so now let's go back to machine learning. Do you remember when I showed you this? You might have wondered for a general talk, why did I show you how to train and tune a machine learning model? Did I say anything about uncertainty models? I didn't say a thing about uncertainty models. This was all about getting the very best single estimate, not an uncertainty model. Now let's go ahead, let's test this concept as machine learning sample the uncertainty. And let's use k-means clustering, which is famous for using heuristic, a solution heuristic that tries to take the complicated problem of grouping samples into groups with maximum similarity and maximum dissimilarity between groups in the multivariate space. Now that approach, we can actually run it multiple times. Let's go ahead and seed some initial prototypes and run it, and look what happened. We got a certain loss, which is right here, it's pretty low, and in fact, I showed this CDF, you can see 95% of the time that I run this model, I get this loss. 1 20th of the time, 5% of the time, I get this loss right here. Let's go ahead and run it again. Do you see what happened? Let me go back. Run it again. You see how the color changed, but the groupings remain the same and the loss remains the same. Let me run it again. Do you see how the color changed, but the we're actually getting the exact same groups? And I run it one more time, same groups. Now watch this right here. This is one of the cases where I get this increased loss. 5% of the time I get this result. I ask you, my friends, is this an uncertainty model? Have I sampled, is this part of the uncertainty? It is not. It is a local minimum. The solution is having an error that is not an adequate uncertainty model. Machine learning models don't in general sample the uncertainty. Now, those of you out there will know that there's Bayesian approaches and others that do attempt to sample the uncertainty, but in general, many of them do not. And so what I'll say is this. We have developed a methodology to train and tune our machine learning models. In fact, we use Clayton Deutsch's accuracy plots where you try to match through cross-validation the right probability to be within an interval. The 20% confidence interval in your uncertainty model should have 20% of the data. The 40% should have 40% of data. And the result is you plot on a line if you have an accurate and precise model. Now, what we did is we put that into our training and tuning of our machine learning models in the loss function. And what we got out was, let's look at a model right here. The predicted versus the true values lies almost on the 45 degree line. It looks like a good model for the accuracy. But when we look at the accuracy plot, look at this. We are plotting below the 45 degree line. We have an inaccurate, imprecise model. We added in the additional criteria of having a good uncertainty model, and the result is that. Let me go back and forth. Look at this. The accuracy of predicted versus true values gets just a little bit worse, but now our uncertainty model gets much better. Eduardo Maldonado Cruz has actually developed a way to get good uncertainty models in our machine learning methodologies, and we can now tune deep learning to have the right level of uncertainty. We must take ownership of our uncertainty model, and we must ensure that our machine learning models are giving a good uncertainty. Okay, let me wrap up. Concluding remarks, subsurface engineering and geoscience have decades of experience with data-driven practice. We are the original data scientists. Go away from this meeting being proud of that. We must integrate these lessons learned over decades, which are many great lessons of how to work with data, with the concepts of competent engineering and geoscience to guide our machine learning adoption. We have to understand what's going on under the hood. We have to check our model results. We have to understand how the systems and have systems thinking, yes. Now, if anybody's watching this and you're thinking, you know, there's a couple of things Dr. Perch said that I don't understand. 
I am committed as a professor at the University of Texas at Austin to share all of my educational content with the world. My YouTube channel, uh, about 20,000 views a month. Thank you very much to all the working professionals who are watching it. I appreciate that. Up to about 25,000 subscribers. Um, has a lot of people checking it out and every single lecture has linked workflows, interactive dashboards, well-documented workflows for you to have hands-on experience. And all of that is available on my GitHub account, including all of the codes for the visualizations that I've shown here today. So go ahead and check out all my educational content. I'm happy to help you out. Uh, let me know if you have any questions, acknowledgements once again. Thank you to all the students and fellow professors and to the center for their support. All right, so I see now that I have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Let me go ahead and I'm going to publish and show one of the questions that I got. Now, if anybody else has any questions here as I've wrapped up, I do welcome any questions at all. Go ahead and put your questions in. Dave asks, are engineers and geoscientists able to learn enough about machine learning to competently apply it? And I really appreciate that question. That, that's a really good question because what I've seen is this. I've taught with Dr. Foster through our, uh, our educational company, Datum. I've taught over 2,000 working professionals. And what we've seen is that engineers and geoscientists, those who work in the subsurface, already understand a lot about data, understand a lot about statistics, about optimization, about probability. And so they do a great job learning and applying data analytics. And so my message to you is if you don't have a lot of skills in data science, there are lots of resources to help you. Go ahead and reach out to me if you're interested and you will be able to learn and apply it very, very well. We've seen that they do a great job, those of us in our industry learning data science. Anonymous asked the following question. And go ahead, if anybody else has questions, I'm happy to discuss right now or I'll hang out with you. I always do that after my lectures. I like to hang out and just talk if anybody has any questions. Do you have more suggestions for competent engineers and geoscientists to apply machine learning? And so I think this is a really good question and you're kind of getting into what are all those other topics I was thinking about, but I didn't have the chance to talk about. Number one, embrace explainable AI. Maybe you cannot compromise on using a simpler model. So it will be very difficult to understand your 10,000 parameter deep learning model, convolutional neural net or whatever it might be. But you can use methods like Shapley to basically take your model, put it in a box, and then understand how your model behaves relative to all of the features. Explainable AI is critical for us being able to understand the systems, being for us to be able to understand the models that we're building and be able to look under the hood. Okay, so I think that's an important concept right there. The other concept I'd say is this, build everything you do on fundamental probability. Remember, all of us know this. Every time you build a histogram, every time you build a CDF, you're using fundamental concepts of probability. In fact, your histogram is a predictive model and it's the CDF is cumulative a cumulative probabilities, right? And so you can use that directly to make decisions, support what you're doing. And so you need to use fundamental probability concepts in everything you do. Okay, that would be another concept I would use. You have to build everything you do. Remember, machine learning is statistical learning and it's all based on probability. Anonymous says, does competent engineering and geoscience practice change for machine learning with the application of low code methods. Now, does everybody know what I mean by low code? Low code is where you have some type of CAN software, a GUI, some type of really nicely developed environment where you take your data, you take the model, you plug the model in, you plug the steps in. There's a lot of guidance and support. Now, I would admit that sometimes low code environments are developed to protect, protect ourselves from fundamental blunders. For examples, for example, often when we use these low code type methods, um, they're also known as pipelines. If you're using standard open source code, what it does, it protects us from what we know as information or data leakage. In other words, when you use those methods, there's no way that you can accidentally use the information from the the information from the training data in the testing data. They're not actually, the, you know, there's no testing data being leaked 
into the training data to improve the model fit at the testing data locations. Okay, so, but at the same time, even though we use can use low code, remember, we still have a responsibility to understand what's going on under the hood. We don't relinquish that. That is something we must still do. Okay, how do you see the future of the industry with Gen AI? What field will be impacted most? And where are the good places to capitalize on using those models? Okay, let me just uh, first of all explain. And Mo, thank you very much for the second question. I do appreciate that. Gen AI, we're referring to machine learning methodologies that generate images and models directly. And so let's just make a couple of comments about that. I did show a couple of examples, and I have to admit, they're not my best examples. There's a lot of other examples that I could have shown to demonstrate this, but it's the idea where you take actual images or time series data and use that to generate new data. Now, I get really excited. If I think about Gen, a Gen AI, there's a specific application. And what that's known as is this image imputation problem. That's where you have missing parts of the image. You could imagine if you do seismic acquisition, you could have areas where you have low, uh, low illumination, you're starting to get subsalt, and you need to go ahead and fill in missing information. Or you could be a situation where you go to greater depth and you're starting to lose your high frequency information. You can use those types of approaches to Gen AI to fill in missing parts. And what's interesting, it uses perceptual and conceptual information. It uses what's going on at the edges, so it conditions to where it patches, and it uses concepts from elsewhere to have a consistent type of filling. Okay, and that's fascinating. I think another area is this super resolution type work. And what you're doing, it picks the picks type of approaches, take where you have low resolution information like seismic, and it fills in high resolution. Now, if you want an example of that, people do drawings of like a cat outline. There's a website that does that and they'll fill in the cat details. Um, people are using that on Seismic. Check out the work by Wen Pan, who's now at Shell, one of my former students. Very exciting work, this downscaling geophysical information to flow ready models by using super resolution approaches. Thank you very much for the question. Okay, Roy said, what's the difference between a statistical model and ML model? Do they mean the same thing? Now, Roy, I don't want to be controversial, but I will. I do agree with the uh, with a lot of the fundamental textbooks. James and All is a really good example of that. They have the book on statistical learning applications in R. And that book, they suggest that machine learning is statistical learning. And when I teach my classes, I on purpose um, go ahead and switch and say statistical learning a lot. The machine learning methodologies are not magic. They are not just a machine. They are a statistical model. And so my my opinion is, Roy, that they're really the same thing. Okay, and I do appreciate that question. That's a great question. And the reason I do that is it reminds us concepts like, remember in stats class, degrees of freedom? Do you remember that? Degrees of freedom is how many independent pieces of information do you have minus how many assumptions you make in your model? You know, degrees of freedom were there to protect ourselves from making up stuff. <laughs> and so I think when we acknowledge that these machines are statistical learning, we start to think critically about fundamental statistical concepts like degrees of freedom. And we may not try like we seen in our hackathon last a couple of years ago. You may not see students take 50 wells and try to fit it with a 10,000 parameter deep learning model. You, you see what I'm saying? We just don't have enough data to do that. Um, are there any good online resources courses you recommend to learn more about machine learning applied to subsurface data? Ham, you know, I, this is self-serving and I do apologize, but if you go ahead and you just type in Geostats guy, you're going to find my YouTube channel. You're going to find um, all of my lectures for all of my courses linked to all of the workflows. You can learn everything my students are learning at the university. And I get emails every almost every day from around the world from working professionals. And the best emails of all, I get emails from the bosses. And the bosses tell me thank you because their people are more productive. And I love that. That just makes me very happy. OK, um, I'm, I should probably truncate it right there. Uh, we are we've run out of time now. Uh, once again, appreciation to the center for this opportunity. And um, if anybody else has further questions, I am Professor Michael Perch at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm always happy to discuss. I'm easy to find. Thank you very much.